powered from the Perdomo Cigar Studios Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from California. It's episode 140 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome Eduardo Fernandez and Terrence Riley of Aganor Salif. And as always, the Primetime Show is sponsored by Saga Cigars. Dagos Reyes Cigars introduces another chapter of the saga, the Saga Celez. Celez is a Spanish word that means leisure after work. In the spirit of the standing ideal of owning your own journey and making your own saga, the Saga Celez is the perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. Saga Celez carries a blend of Criollo Olor and Piloto Cubano wrapped in a selected Ecuador Shade Claro that generously delivers with elegance a surprisingly rich and balanced smoke. It's available in three sizes at an affordable price. Be sure to ask your retailer for Saga Celez. And by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal, Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand requires tobacco to have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend they balance complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigar is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo State Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double H 12-Year Vintage, Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne, Perdomo Obama Bourbon and Arrow Age, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Aganorsa Leaf. Great Leaf makes great cigars. Aganorsa Leaf stands out because of the distinctive flavor of our Corojo 99 and Criollo 98 seeds cultivated by Cuban agronomists on the best lands of Jalapa and Esteli, Nicaragua. When you smoke one of our JFR, JFR Lunatic, Guardian of the Farm, or Casa Fernandez cigars, you experience the unique taste and aroma that makes Aganorsa Leaf special. Smoke one today and enjoy the signature flavor of Aganorsa Leaf. And by Miami Cigar and Company. Nesta Miranda said it best. There is a mystery and depth to Africa that captivates my spirit, always drawing me to come back. This cigar, Don Lino Africa, captures the way going there makes me feel. Cigar making is an art form, but in that moment when the cigar becomes art itself, you have something special. Don Lino Africa returns from Miami Cigar and Company. This time, the blend you remember blend blended even more masterfully this time in partnership with Tobacco Lara A.J. Fernandez. An exotic and complex blend meant to mesmerize. It's available in five box press vitolas. Don Lino Africa returns. Ask for it at your local retailer and by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. Available on iTunes and Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming on the Primetime Show is sponsored by Drew Estate. Well, welcome, everybody. This is episode 140 of the Primetime Show. Today is Thursday, May 28th, 2020. This is Will Cooper. I'm on the black stage in the Perdomo Scott Studios, joined cross-country by my friend and colleague, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How are you doing tonight, Will? Um, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good. Got a bit of a heat wave over here, but uh, hopefully that wraps up soon. I know you got some rain coming your way. Yeah, we've had bands, and I was just saying we had bands and bands of rain coming in, uh, and uh, it is uh, it is very wet. <laughs> uh, we had a little break on Memorial Day. That was the only day we had a break for like uh, any outdoor stuff. Nice, and uh, your uh, your bracket isn't doing too well, so it's kind of keeping that depressing theme going on for you. Yeah. But you know what's weird? The brackets, like, as bad as I started out, like, most people's brackets are busted right now. Oh, yeah. We all ended up in the same place. Yeah. Um, so it, as weird as it may sound, I might not finish in last place with this. Not that I'm going to win it. Yeah, Bear's not looking too good. Bear, Bear, Bear's not looking too good. But everyone who picked those American League baseball teams has been – I don't think anyone's got those four. Like, right? Does anyone have an American League team left in there? Bear does. He has the 04 socks. That's it. He's the only guy left. He's the only guy left. Yeah. Yeah. And it figures he'd have that one, but, but you know, cause everyone had the Yankees going in that tournament. Yeah. So imagine if it's Miguel and and Hector, the Reds and the Mets, it's (laughs) it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, unbearable. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'm like Hector, your Mets are like, you should be happy where you are right now. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Just relax. But uh, no, so that that's that's crazy as that's going. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, if we don't have baseball, I was uh, gonna see if Hector wanted to simulate something for us this year. If they don't do mm-hmm. another dream bracket, yeah, so, yeah, maybe we'll do that because Hector's got the simulator. 
Yep. But anyway, um, I think we should introduce our guests tonight. Um, yes. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome uh, both these gentlemen. Um, great to have them both on the show. Uh, Mr. Eduardo Fernandez and Mr. Terrence Riley of Aganorsa Leaf. Eduardo and Terrence, welcome to primetime tonight. Thank you for having us. Oh, Thank you for an, having us. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, I know we've been wanting we, – we, Terrence has been a great friend of the show, and Eduardo, we've been wanting to have you on, and we do appreciate you making the time on this Thursday night. So thank you very, very much. From Nicaragua. Yes, <laughs> from Nicaragua. So it's a little earlier for you than for me, at least. So, so we won't keep <laughs> right. you too late. But, uh, no, we, we do really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, Terrence, you're not out on the balcony, or are you just uh... – I'm, I'm out on the balcony. Oh, but you have the uh, – yes, you have uh, – Yes, promotional the, purposes. The virtue, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, this is great to have um, um, you guys on. So you know, Eduardo, um, you know, you you have this operation Agonorsa Leaf, which we're going to talk a lot about, and um, it's it's just a great conglomerate with a lot of moving parts. And um, I'd like to kind of st- what we always like to start off with, though, is we like to always find out about our guests and their first cigar smoking experience. So, Eduardo, what was your introduction to smoking cigars? Okay, basically Cuban types because I lived in Spain for 10 years. So, my basic introduction to cigars was uh, while I lived in Spain uh, with Cuban cigars, which are easy and and reasonable to get there. And uh, how old were you like when you started? Did you start young? Did you start older? No, in my mid-30s. Okay. That's about when Crazy. I I started. I about when I started too. Mm-hmm. Except you're you're a lot younger than me, so I'm <laughs> I'm actually older than I look. So no, so that's um. But what were you doing prior um to, to getting into the cigar business in Spain? Okay, uh, when I graduated from the university, I, I studied finance and uh, I went to work in international banking in New York City, and I worked there for ten years. Uh, but being Cuban, I always had an entrepreneurial streak in me and wanted my own business. Uh, but it was hard enough to crack because of the uh, having the working capital or even the knowledge to start a business. But I was lucky uh, in my mid-30s. Uh, I started a, with my brother a, a pizza chain similar to Domino's, but we also sold in, in the store similar to New York type uh, pizza pies and slices. It was very successful from day one. So we grew like uh, rabbits and uh, expanded quickly. And within a 10 year period, uh, for me, it was enough. And I decided to, to sell. So we went public in the stock market in Europe and uh, I sold my shares. And with that money, I retired. I gained my financial independence. But soon enough, I got bored. And I said, what am I gonna do the rest of my life? I was 48 years old. Uh, and then I decided that to be involved in agriculture, something I'd always dreamt of, and I work in stages in life, and this was, let's say, my final act. And it would be uh, my lifetime experience from then on. Uh, so I, I came to Nicaragua and Costa Rica looking for agricultural projects. And funny enough, I fell in love with uh, Nicaragua. I found it a very receptive country with people very friendly. Uh, land prices were still very reasonable because of the revolution. And if you don't inherit land, it's not the, it's very expensive to purchase. Uh, so I came here and uh, very receptive. The, the ocean was close to me too. Having been born in Cuba, I was always an island person. And in Costa Rica, then to San Jose, to the ocean was like a four or five hour drive through mountains. In Nicaragua, within an hour, you could be in the ocean. So that was also attractive to me. So I settled on Nicaragua and then I started looking for what I could do in Nicaragua. And from the host to me, I found that Nicaraguan tobacco was one of the best in the world. Back then, it was the uh, end of the, of the boom. And uh, not many people were basically getting out or crashing. In, in the, uh, but I started small because I had to, in my, in my conception of business, you have to basically uh, crawl, then you walk, and then you run. And tobacco is very complex and uh, a lot of detail, a lot of knowledge, a lot of years experience are required. So I went to Cuba, which I had never been in 40 years. I left in 1960 when I was a 10-year-old boy and was raised in the States. That's where I got my education and my basic business for, form. Uh, and in Cuba, I, I, I went to Huelta Bajo, which is the famous growing area 
the number one in the world. There's no question about it. Uh, these two little towns called San Luis and San Juan. So I recruited uh, some old farmers that were basically in their 60s and 70s, but they had all the knowledge in the world. And that's how I really began the, my tobacco experience, you know, because people are very important in business. In fact, they're everything. And uh, because of the crash, we were very fortunate that uh, land became available, uh, very rich, uh, qualified land that had been planted since the 60s by the Cubans that had originally come to Nicaragua both in Jalapa and Esteli and in Condega. So it was one of those situations that Eduardo, you grab this or you let it go. Sometimes in life opportunities come about and one, you're lucky to see it, then you, you really have to uh, take your chance or, or let it pass, no? And it yeah. was too good to pass because tobacco land is, is very particular, the regions and everything involved. And this was, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, I jumped in it in a big way. So that's how I began. This was 1998. I landed in Nicaragua in 97. Uh, funny enough, Placencia, which I had met and was introduced to, uh, suggested that tobacco was, you know, very interesting and good business. One of the aspects that I really liked because I came from an international environment was that uh, our quality of tobacco was, you know, worldwide famous. So it could be an international experience. It was obviously not in Nicaragua. People don't smoke here much, but it was, uh, basically an international uh, exposure. So that was very attractive to me. And that's how it all began. So it began where you wanted to get into Nicaragua in the agronomy piece of that, the agricultural exactly, piece. Exactly, right. Right. And, uh, but tobacco was, and tobacco was what you, what, was it, were you seeking out tobacco at the time? Or was it like you just- Oh, it's just by serendipity. Sometimes things come about naturally you no know? it's like nature right. you know? which i often to me it's like a sign you no know? that's meant for you right it's not forced upon you or you're not forcing it it just comes naturally you know just yeah. like when you meet a girl and she's friendly she's nice it helps yeah. a lot that you have to uh convince her you no know? right so uh, i look at life sometimes in that way you know opportunities come about and you're lucky and i'm a lucky person in essence overall so uh, it's something you know that that's like was kind of meant to be Right. And I just grabbed the opportunity and never looked back. Sure. And I also, uh, in my business, I always do things in a big way because in the end, you know, it's the same energy, the same stress, basically the same work, whether it's small or big. Uh, you just need to build the structure and have the right people. It took a while. No? Life is not easy. No? A lot of sure. hard knocks, but that's how you learn. No? And that's how you, you learn from your mistakes and your errors and, and you become better at it. It's a process. No, no it sure is. It's yours. Did, was it around that time when you acquired uh, Tobacco Lara Tropical from uh, Pedro Martin as well? No, it, it, that happened like four years later because I started from the agricultural. So my respect and love for the leaf was first and, all, and, and very important. You know? So I did things a uh, uh, very traditional way, very old fashioned Cuban style, not cutting corners. In, in business, time is money, especially if you come from the finance end. Right. And tobacco requires a lot of time. It also requires a lot of capital because you have to hold the tobacco, ferment it, grow it, etc. It's not a one, two, three process. Uh, it's very time consuming, but it pays back. And it's, it's, you can't take shortcuts, otherwise you start suffering uh, quality. And we don't do that in, in our business. But part of our culture is to let the tobacco have everything it, it requires. It speaks to you. It tells you when it's needed. You don't push it. You don't rush it. And it's very important to get that full flavor and aroma and the complexity of the leaf that Nicaragua offers to give it all it takes. No? So that to us is very important and above all, you know, number one. So that's how it, it kind of came about. We got uh, started selling leaf and I met Pedro Martin. Pedro Martin, apart from founder of Tropical Tobacco, a great gentleman, uh, connoisseur of cigars from way back when. Because, uh, uh, he, he in Cuba he was had his own factory and very knowledgeable fellow. In the U.S. he was very successful in the tobacco business. So he had a leaf side, a leaf broker business on the side, and he loved our material and the stuff we were doing. So he started representing me uh, in some of the sales in Dominican Republic, etc. And then he decided to to retire. He was in his 80s, and he called me out of the blue and said, "Eduardo, you're the man to take this over." He says Pedro, just enough busy here in Nicaragua with the land and, and the growing side. But he said, you know, uh, 
you're the man, you know, to put it all together. So I was lucky enough to have a cousin, Paul Palmer, uh, who's the president of the company. And he, uh, he was open to the idea and had the knowledge of tobacco that at that time I, I was not privy to in terms of American uh, tobacco, trademarks and flavors, etc. So uh, based on him and, you know, having the person, because I said, you know, my job is fully in Nicaragua. I cannot be in both places. Uh, so I need somebody in the States to, to handle that side. So that's how uh, having the person, uh, I said yes to, to, to Pedro, no? Right. And he stayed with us for like four or five years. He's a very collaborative and very knowledgeable fellow. Uh, it was a great experience. No, I was lucky to know him and, and, and teach, teach me some, you know, some <laughs> matters of tobacco. No? Right. And, and at the same time, you were still very much in a learning phase on the tobacco and the growing, right? So you, you right. Not, yeah. How did that, like, like how did it, because it seemed like it happened very quickly that, that you were able to take these farms and turn them into some of the most um, you know, sought after tobacco in the world very quickly, you know, and how did that well, all I brought, come about? Like I said, uh, these old hands from, uh, from Cuba, no? from right. Vuelta Abajo. And these fellows, you know, basically from the age of 15, uh, grew in the tobacco field. Their father and grandfather uh, were living in the same house in these little farmsteads. And uh, that's the Cuban tobacco culture, you know, it goes back three, 400 years that uh, ancestors back, you know, when started and, and they never let go. So the, the knowledge and experience and respect and, and, you know, how they give their life to, to the leaf, uh, to me, was very important. They were also uh, cover leaf growers. Cover leaf growers are like the major leagues. It's like playing for the Yankees. Right. One is to grow sun grown, et cetera. But when you grow cover leaf, you have to be very good at it. You repeat it, you know, year in, year out, because it's an expensive investment and process. And if you don't produce cover leaf, you know, you soon fail. Yeah. So I was lucky to, to be able to get some of these old hands. To me, it was also very, you know, interesting because being Cuban, et cetera, was, uh, got me again into the Cuban culture. Uh, because my dream is, still is, to go back to Cuba, but obviously I cannot. Uh, if it opens up, etc., I would definitely go back and, and do tobacco there as well. So it all worked very much in hand. My vision has always been to do things the old-fashioned way. Tobacco has been done for hundreds of years, no? So I'm not a gimmicky person of doing new things or... Uh, or trying new leaves from different places and combinations. I'm very a traditionalist in that sense. I experiment and we do things, but basically in the old fashioned way. You know? I still remember one time I was taken to a Robina farm and I had already uh, met him and talked to him many times, but I, uh, I went with Arsenio, who's very important in my life as well and the tobacco, just as Pedro Martin. And um, we found him finally in the smokehouse and it was like uh, 6.30 in the afternoon, dusk. And he said, no, he was very good friends with Arsenio. He says, Arsenio, I tried this year a new little thing and I'm trying to see how it, you know, how, you know, how it looks. And this fellow, you know, world famous, 80 some years old, was still trying, you know, something different or new within, you know, the same leaf, the same seed, et cetera, and the same tradition, but trying to see if he could do it better. And that, you know, impresses me a lot. No? So it always stayed in my mind, that little detail. No? You can always improve. You can always do things better. Uh, and you, you have to be open uh, to that experience. And you have to look for it. No? And, and also listen to people. I have uh, some of my Cuban hands that give me some of the great ideas that, it, that uh, we put in place. Great ideas that I, I give them credit for. I say, you know, Speed about me this. Or Asinto mentioned that. Uh, or Asenio did this. Because uh, they deserve the credit. No, I have no problem in that regard. And uh, it's things that I appreciate and, uh, and that we put in place, and it makes us better. And you mentioned you mentioned Arsenio. Um, did you meet him on those tr on that trip to Cuba? No, I went back several times. And at the beginning, I, I sold a lot of my crop to Canary Islands which they made tobacco there to compete with the Cubans, you know, for the Spanish market and European market. And there I met the, the second largest buyer of Cuban tobacco back then. First was a fellow from Belgium named Metaphor. And this fellow named Socorro, he bought uh, a lot of Cuban tobacco through, the, through times, no? And, and he was a broker. And uh, they helped me buy and, 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 and distribute in, in Europe 
the, the, my bales that I was producing then. And uh, he told me about Arsenio. And he said, you have to go to Cuba and you have to meet this fellow. This fellow is, you know, out of this world, He's, you know, world class. And he's basically sitting at home, you know, he was driving a bicycle. They don't even have a car for the fellow. And at one time he was in charge of all the fermentation, Pinal de Rio, you know, uh, you know one of these, uh, I wouldn't call him superhuman, but, you know, a fellow very complete, and very noble and very knowledgeable. Uh, so I was able to bring him on early, like in 1991. And uh, he was extremely helpful to, he, he, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was a great blender. He knew our stuff in and out. And uh, he was a peasant, but a peasant self-educated, wrote beautifully, a very, very uh, kind individual and also, you know, very, very complete. Yeah, a lot. I mean, I said everyone, I know when he passed away, it was a very sad day for a lot of people in the industry. Uh, mm -hmm. He was just so well-respected. Um, right sure uh, some yeah it's, uh, these people they're not replaceable unfortunately yeah. you know yeah yeah you know i was just uh I, it was funny i just had a talk with my son i said you know he's having a problem at work i said be careful because you may be replaceable and i'm thinking well maybe there's a few exceptions of people not being replaceable and that's certainly very hard <laughs> arsenio is certainly one for sure i can think of yeah yeah yeah, yeah so much knowledge so, so much know i don't know yeah um Let's turn to the tobacco. Um, and you kind of mentioned that you were really a lot, a lot of old school when it comes to tobacco. Is that why, like, the Aganorsa farms have so much focused on Corojo 99 and Criollo 98? Because those are the tobaccos you're, you're really known for. Right. No, these are the two Cuban seeds. The originals uh, were, were Corojo and Criollo, but because of the blue mold, et cetera, they were wiped out. They were not uh, disease resistant. So uh, Cuba took many years, developed the Corojo 99 and the Criollo 98. Um, they went to the Havana 2000, the Havana 92, and different hybrids, but they didn't quite do the job until the Criollo and Corojo came on the scene. So uh, I have no problem, you know, borrowing the seed or, or using it because it, 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 it transmits the, the Cuban flavor uh, to me in the best way. It may not have the best yield. It may not be as resistant as other new hybrids that are done. But to me, tobacco is all about flavor and aroma, mm -hmm. especially flavor. Flavor is extremely important. And sometimes some, some of these new hybrids that are coming out, uh, to me, are, are not top quality, you know? Right. Tobacco, Pedro Martin and, and Arsenio taught me, cannot dominate. A blend is a mixture of great, beautiful things that come together and make it even more beautiful and expressive. But you cannot have one leaf that dominates. You cannot smoke something and say, hey, this has this, uh, because it, you know, the signature's on there and it's dominant. It cannot be dominant. Some tobaccos in some countries have that, uh, that weakness. That's a weakness because it, you notice and you say, oh, this tobacco, you, know, you, you can taste it, it's this. To me, a blend should not be that way. It should be what, so well blended that in itself it's a new product, you know? but nothing dominates. So Nicaragua, in that sense, same as Cuba, uh, has that unique quality, you know, as well as blending. You can blend and you blend all day, just Nicaraguan tobacco. And the Corojo and, and, the, uh, and the Criollo seed uh, lend itself to that. The, we, we grow in the three traditional areas, which is Jalapa, Condega, and, and, uh, and Esteli. And within all three, we can make hundreds of blends. It's incredible. And each one is unique and special to us. So uh, it's one of the, I would say, uh, the blessings of Nicaragua, land and, and, and people. Right, so with these two seeds in different regions combined with different primings, this is how you get all those permutations of what, you're, uh, right. what you come up with, uh, which yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, like um, we have seven, let's say seven farms in, in Jalapa, no? Mm -hmm. But each farm we divide in lots. Some, some farms could have seven, eight lots and they smoke differently. You learn to differentiate them, and, and obviously we kept them separate. So all those things, you know, in the end make a blend. You know, some are better than others. You know, not none are bad, but some are just you know out of this world, and blend very well with other things. So that's part of the blending art. You know, so we yeah. we 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 pay a lot of attention to to smoking the the actual uh, tobacco, the primings in the lots to make sure they're, they're where they should be. 
Because every year, obviously, nature plays a game on you, and the human hand does as well. Tobacco are touched over 300 times by human hands. So errors are committed, mistakes are made, and quality is never you know, regained. When you lose quality, it's lost. It's not something that you can fix. It's not mechanical. It's not a, uh, it's a living organism that, you know, is, let's say, uh, transforming. Uh, and that transformation is extremely important. But it, you have to, uh, once you, you lose a certain aspect of it, it's lost. Uh, so you have to be very cognizant of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, one, one thing that I always found is kind of like Aganorsa has this secret sauce in some of their blends has been the Medio Tiempo. Um, and it seems like when it comes to your farm, uh, Eduardo, Medio Tiempo, you guys have mass. I know you don't always don't get a lot of yield on it, but you've, you've been able to kind of, I think, master getting that leaf. Um, what have you been able to do maybe to, to be successful with, with getting Medio Tiempo, even in the small yield you may get well it's, it's basically produced by criollo and in in the uh, esteli region where the dirt is it's a lot heavier right uh we don't produce many of it we produce like 50 bales it's not that much funny enough because it has to be very thick it's almost called a like crocodile skin right and funny enough we didn't use to pick on it uh we used to just throw it in as ligero unbeknownst to us and one of our big customers or biggest customer said hey we don't want this leaf you know this coarse leaf take it out so we started separating and then you know again I was taught because I, I was not born with this knowledge that's medio tiempo or maduro they also call it right uh, and it smokes different yeah, incredibly it has a certain gravitas it uh, it anchors a blend uh, gives it a certain heaviness which is not replaceable because sometimes we run out and we tried to use Lijero and it's just not the same. Incredible, it's a, it's a, it's a distant cousin even though they're very close. Yeah, so, so it's that, so many- That has yeah. a special flavor, or, I call it gravitas, you know? That, yeah. That you, you can, you know, feel it. And some of our customers like it very much. Yeah, there was one person who was telling me that they, were, they had used it. Um, and then they, they tried to substitute the Lajero and they said it wasn't even close is what they said. No, they no, it's totally yeah. different. Uh, yeah. a, that was a surprise to me as well, but that's, that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a exactly. unique leaf. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but it's made some, gr I mean, you've been able to do some great, great blends with it. So I, I enjoy it. I can tell you that. Um, mm -hmm. It just, uh, and for folks who don't know, it, that's the highest, prim it's a higher priming than Lajero on the plant, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. the highest. But again, it, it, it doesn't come often. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a unique leaf in itself because of yeah. its coarseness and its taste. And the taste is similar uh, once you put it all together. No? Yeah. So that's how we came about. No, we, uh, we separate. Same uh, on the lower primings. We separate what's called uh, in Cuba the volado, no? the, the very low priming. They mix it in with the seco, but it should be separate. In Cuba, they, they, don't, uh, they don't use that in their factories. Um, here, they just put it all together. No, we separate it because for blending, it, it's, it's very important to have the right leaf in that bale, not have one that's a little bit off, because otherwise your blend will be a little off. And that very low priming has, a, I call it like a mule's kick. Sometimes it comes to bite you. Right. And you don't want that in your leaf, no? So our, our seco is, is very, uh, we, we separate. Like I say, I don't think almost anybody does it, but we do because we're very much into blending. No? And to us, uh, it should be separated. We follow Q in that tradition. They do it. You know? Right. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, that's very true. Um, do you actually, when you actually do the primings, you separate, you go by each priming level? Or is it just you group Lajero, Seiko, Viso? Or do you like go? Oh, no, he, yeah, the leaf gives all the different primings, no? Right. Um, but then when we sort it, I mean, we, um, it, it's very detail oriented. When you cut, you have to put the priming down. Obviously, the seed. We put the farm in the lot and obviously the region. So all that knowledge we have and we keep it right to the bale. The bale will tell you, you know, what cutting, what priming from what farm, from what lot. It's very important for blending uh, uh, prospects, no? So if it's cutting number four, cutting number three, uh, it's very important. 
Now, sometimes a cutting number three uh, can produce seco and can pro or can produce viso, uh, as we call it in Nicaragua. So we separate, you know, even though it's cutting number three, it could be a seco or it could be a viso, depending on the coarseness of the leaf and the strength that's, uh, that's represented. So it's very important, uh, you, you read the leaf, the leaf tells you everything. And again, you need that knowledge to, uh, to be able to sort, no? Our people have, you know, 18, 20 years experience or even more, no? Yeah. Uh, doing this type of labor, it's very uh, intensive. The, the knowledge is very important. That's why you can't grow tobacco anywhere. You know, in, in Cuba now they grow in different places, which is a big, big mistake. But they have to take people from Vuelta Bajo <laughs> to different regions to show them how to do it because they, they don't know how. And that knowledge has to be transmitted. Uh, it just can't be learned in a book or in a lecture. Very true. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, absolutely agree. And like I said, I don't know much compared to you know what you would know. And but yeah, um, I could. It's it's. I would agree with that statement. You um, you you made like I said. There's a lot of great cigars you've worked on on that Corojo ninety nine Criollo ninety eight. When it's come to Maduro, um, for a long time you were using San Andreas, and it's now only recently that you have started to use some of your own leaf as Maduro. What right. took long to kind of do that when you, you know, I know you've done great things with San Andreas, um, but it's only recently that you've kind of now started using the only from Maduro. Right. It's shade grown Corojo in Jalapa, but from an upper cutting, cutting number four, cutting number five. It just took like 20 years for the land to be able to produce that type of leaf that would burn properly and perform its duty. And it's a very unique taste and, and strength. Uh, so it, it just happened by, you know, a lot of effort and time and dedication uh, because every year we put back into, into the land uh, different elements to make it better, uh, to get it back to its original state, let's call it. No, it, it had been uh, mistreated during the revolution and, and, and thereafter by other people that used it. So uh, it took a, a long time to, to, to bring it back to its uh, its old glory let's call it that way yeah now you you mentioned though that you're you and that's something that you've obviously experimented with and uh, you know you've just started to to roll those out right now are there any other leaves that you're experiment any other seeds maybe you're experimenting with or maybe one and we've seen folks try to grow nicaraguan broadleaf there's other corojo varietals is there anything else that you're looking at right now maybe it's yes this something year we uh I went to Cuba a couple of years ago and uh, I asked to smoke uh, from the smokehouse some tobacco that had been fermented at a friend's uh, very important fellow, I don't want to mention, but uh, one of the most recognized fellows in Cuba. And uh, I asked him for uh, Corojo 2010 and 2012 uh, if I could smoke it. We, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, we use, I call them reefers, you know, little smokes yeah. that we do. With a, with a particular, just a cutting from a particular land or something, and it tells us a lot about the, the tobacco. And we're very, we use that uh, accordingly. So I said, you know, just to make a little reefer, I call it a reefer because it come back from the 1960s, and, and smoke it. So we smoked it, uh, Arsenio was with me. Uh, he was already sick, but he was in Cuba. And uh, Jacinto, and, and we smoked uh, the two cigars. I mean, the two little reefers. And uh, we liked the 2012 very much. It was very much in our realm of uh, taste. Uh, the 2010, in my estimation, or our estimation was a little bit bronco, a little bit wild. Uh, maybe it wasn't fermented properly, or, or who knows, no? So we choose, chose 2012. Just recently, I had some leaf brought from, from Cuba, as, again, to retest it. Uh, reefers from there. <laughs> that I asked on the two var varietals. And again, you know, our estimation of this 2000 was, uh, was right on. And they're using it in Cuba. They use both 2012 and, and 2010. But to us, the, in our flavor profile, 2012 seemed to hit the mark. So we planted quite a bit this year. And we were very, uh, in the field, they behaved very, very well. So we're very much excited about it. But again, we have to taste it and, you know, after fermentation to, to, to know its full value. But it's very promising. So it'll be hopefully a new leaf that we'll be able to use in our, in our blending uh, uh, 
stable. What kind of profile does that? You have to keep up with the times. Huh? Yeah. What, what kind of profile does that Croho 12 have? Um, it's a little more refined uh, in terms of cover leaf. It, it seems to provide more of the uh, Cohiba look, you know, that okay. uh, light walnut uh, type uh, color, which is um, very sought after mm -hmm. and kind of hard to get because you get it from a lower priming. So we're very excited about it. And uh, yes. again, you know, we'll have to see how it interplays with the, the 99 and the 98. In fact, this year as well, I, I got a refresher seed from Cuba and then go to 99, which I also planted. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm looking to cop to to compare that with the old Coro 99 that I that I've used for the last you know eight ten years. So that that'll also be interesting. Everything has to be smoked. Uh, well, you're, yeah. you're, Aaron, you're smoking there. Yeah. Smoking in the end is, tells you what's good or not right. so good. Yeah. Uh, and it's the flavor mostly that uh, you know whether it, it does you know the the, the, the nice effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're very excited, but it's it's going to be uh, something new for us, and you know give us like a couple of new toys to play with. Yeah. That's awesome. How long does it take for like to bring that into a blend? Do you have to go through a few crops, or is it just kind of a trial and error to see at one point when it's ready? No, once the tobacco is planted and, and grown, let's say at the stage we're in now, we're collecting from the, the smokehouses and, and still some is, is being cut. Uh, that'll take about a year plus to be fermented. Uh, the ligero takes probably a year and a half. You know? the, the seco and the lower primates take less you know, because it's a thinner leaf. So it, it'll take probably about a year plus and then we'll, we'll start testing or tasting it. No? Right. I mean, we taste it along the way but it's not ready until it's ready. Uh, so until it's ready, you can't really smoke. <laughs> the rest is just, you know, you know you're on track to something, but you don't know exactly where until it's, you get there. Very good. Aaron, is there anything else you had on the tobacco or the agricultural end of things that we, we want to cover? No, I think you hit it there. Okay, great. Eduardo, are the farms, do you have other agricultural businesses on these farms besides tobacco, or are they strictly dedicated to tobacco? No, it's strictly dedicated to tobacco. When you plant tobacco, you can't regrow anything else. There. Right. You don't really plant anything. Uh, if anything, just beans or, or something to add to the soil, nutrients, sure. and help the structure. So it lays follow. No, we don't, uh, we don't run cattle there or anything. It's just strictly for tobacco. So tobacco land is, is kept you know, in the best condition possible. Uh, lately, I've been using a, a bean that... Uh, the Turrens in Mexico, which where I buy the the cover the uh, the Mexican uh, cover leaf, uh, gave me this this bean seed, and it grows like a huge carpet, this thick, <laughs> and adds nitrogen to the soil. It kills all the weeds, uh, so we're using that, and it uh, it helps like protect the soil, you know, and and add nutrients and kill the weeds, you know, that uh, that would grow otherwise mm -hmm. because it doesn't let anything else grow. Right. Exactly. So we're using that as a, as a, you know, a way to rest the soil. So Turning. our other things are grown somewhere else in different land, different areas, not, not at all in the same. Doesn't, right. They don't mix. Right. Understood. Totally understood there. Uh, and that's good news for us as cigar enthusiasts for sure. Right. Right. For no, these are lands that are unique. They should be protected. No, and not to grow something else on and the uh, that's an after crop. No? Yeah, very true. Yeah, for for a while, um, we mentioned tobacco or tropical, but for a while you had offset some production to Honduras. Uh, mm -hmm. where you were making stuff at Races Cubanas. What went into, why, would, why were you making stuff at Honduras for, I mean, I think you still make some stuff there, but why were you doing, you, it seemed like you were doing a lot of stuff at Honduras a few years ago. Okay, uh, go back in history. Uh, with Pepin Garcia, no? You know him? Yep. Okay. He started with me, no? Yes. And uh, we started El Rey de los Habanos in, in Miami, this and that, then uh, he asked to come to Nicaragua and, and, and take over the factory that I had. So uh, I gave him that opportunity. When that happened, I said, sometimes in marriages, uh, they're not the, uh, I would say, the best relationships. They have to be, you know, eliminate little minor irritants. 
So one to me seeing that we should not make our own brands or our own private labels uh, under that same factory because we would be competing right. with uh, Rey de los Habanos. No, Rey de los Habanos was a separate entity uh, where we were partners and had its own unique business. And Tropical was something I had bought from Pedro Martin long before and had its own trademarks, etc. So in order to eliminate uh, possible frictions, I decided to, to go to Raices Cubana, take the blends, take my tobacco, and have uh, Tropical uh, blends done at Raices. So uh, I basically you know, separated one from the other. Uh, it wasn't accepted totally, but I said, that's the way it, it has to be. Uh, Raices was, was a buyer of tobacco from me for maybe 10 years or eight years or whatever. And they were very good at, uh, at making cigars and quality cigars. So we took our blends there, we showed them what we wanted and, and we gave them the actual leaf. And because obviously our leaf is very important. It's very important to the blends. In fact, sometimes he run out and he says, Eduardo, I can't find another leaf that smokes like yours. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd be you know, up in arms saying I have to stop production because there's no other you know, Ligero or Seco I can find that you know, yeah, has your same flavor. So that's how it all came about. You know, I, we moved to there and, and uh, we worked with them for quite a few years. No? Then as time went by, I said, ah, let's create our own factory again. And then we brought back most of our stuff and we still do things with them. Uh, but most of it, it was brought back. Right. And, and when that was, that was after the partnership with Pepin um, dissolved that you went back there, was that pretty much when that happened? Yeah, pretty much so. Let me, in, let me ask you. Tobacco, yeah. you, you have to be, uh, from my perspective, you have to be vertically integrated. Right. One of the first things I saw when I entered the business from the farming side, that you had to grow your own tobacco. You couldn't, you know, sometimes people uh, uh, finance other people to grow their tobacco. But I find that sometimes it's at odds and you don't know exactly what you have. Right. Uh, they may tell you what it is, but it may not be exactly true. So to me, um, the areas that are important or key in business, you should control because they're your destiny. And in tobacco, there are certain things that are very important is to know exactly what you have in your hands when you make a blend and the quality and the fermentation was done correctly and, and that it's the correct seed and all these things. Because you're making you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of tobacco that supposedly are, are include this blend or include these leaves. And if they're not correct, if they're not true, you're not going to get the product that you, you know, wanted at the beginning. You know? So it's very important to control the processes in tobacco from my perspective. So it took me like a year to learn that because I noticed that when I finance people, they, you know, they, they did things a little bit different than I expected. And yet I was already, you know, on the boat, you know, out in the, in the sea, and I had to accept what they would give me. Uh, they, they had a different culture of how to grow things. Uh, like one thing I learned at first in Nicaragua, the, the Nicaraguans, they, uh, they use guns and irrigate the tobacco from above. In Cuban style, you irrigate from below. So the leaf is actually not touched, just at the very, you know, beginning stage. Uh, if you if you keep you know using sprinklers and and, and and irrigating it's much easier, but you're washing the damn leaf. You're washing the natural oils and many of the things that are important in tobacco, and you end up with a, a leaf that could almost be you know a banana leaf. And not literally, but you know what I'm saying. Squash right. is yeah. not proper. So all these things, all these details are extremely important. So to us, the leaf is everything, and the fermentation is extremely important. And it has to be done correctly. It can't be pushed. It can't be, no shortcuts can be taken because it's not the same. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Was Arsenio, play, did he play a big role in, in terms of the fermentation, like you, you know, mastering the fermentation? At, yes, at he was fermentation. a master of fermentation. Yeah, he used to uh, ferment the, the Cohiba uh, leaves. Uh, and he was, you know, uh, from the very beginning, helped choose the lots and all that. And he was in charge of all the fermentation in Pinal de Rio, which was, you know, huge. And we we're like uh, Lilliputians <laughs> next yeah. to Pinal de Rio. Right. And they're just uh, uh, huge tons of tobacco. And he was in charge of all that. 
so he's extremely knowledgeable, a very thoughtful person, and uh, very much in the Cuban tradition of old. You know? Yeah, that's your thing. He had a great palate. The palate is Absolutely. Uh, it's Absolutely. very important. Uh, you, you find people sometimes that they, they can't taste, <laughs> and you can't, you can't teach them to taste. There's something as, as uh, elemental as that. Some people just don't have it. Uh, Very, yeah. So uh, he yeah. had just a, an exquisite palate, same as Pedro Martin. I mean, they're unique individuals in that regard. And and you have you mentioned Pedro Martin, but you uh, you mentioned that you have the portfolio of his brand still, right? So those are, yes. uh, those blends are all predicate. So that's a big advantage because that company yes. was around a long time. Right, right, yeah, yeah. We have a lot of uh, trademarks that are that are very useful. Yeah, we we got to ask. Yeah, we got asked. Someone asked about Particularis, which is the one that you sell through Syndicato. People were asking about right. that one. Yeah. yeah, they asked us for the you know for the trademark, and we reached an agreement with them that they could use it, and we make a great cigar for them. And they're very yeah. happy with it. Yeah, that's a Nic that's all Nicaraguan puro. That cigar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good cigar. And you know, we were talking about the factory. So you have, you know, the, the tops of factory is, is the, the, you know, your factory in Nicaragua. But you also have, an, you have another factory up in Jalapa, correct? Yes, the Jalapa one we just recently closed. And we opened it in Esteli in another location. Oh, okay. We make, we make a lot of cigars for Spain. Uh -huh. um, almost three million cigars for Spain. Spain and Europe. Uh, like I say, I've always been close to Europe and used to competing with the Cuban cigars with our tobacco. No? Yeah, uh, we have a trademark that's ours called Condega, and it, it does extremely well oh, all through Europe. You guys, I've seen that one at the trade show a few times. That cigar, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they've done an extremely good job, and last year we produced yeah. almost three million cigars for them. Yeah. And to sell that many cigars in Europe against the Cubans is not easy. Let me tell you. Yeah. But our tobacco and the blend and and their uh, salesmanship has, has uh, done a great job in that regard. Yeah. And then you have a factory in Miami as well, the Casa Fernandez. Yeah, we have a little one in Miami. It's yeah. kind of an idea to use Cuban rollers and also to have it close to the best. Yeah. To uh, any bottlenecks or anything where people come and visit. So we have a, a small, that's a small little factory, but done very Cuban. You know, only have one uh, a, a fellow that bunches and rolls in the Cuban style. You know? and they're all Cubans that came from the island, and that's what they did in one yeah. of the factories there. Yeah. Yeah, we have a little bit of everything. <laughs> now, for a long time, um, I've I've smoked the Casa Fernandez cigars uh, before the rebranding, and I still do. Um, and I remember when Terrence came on board, you know, he kind of referred to you guys as as the sleeping giant out there because a lot of us right. were smoking the Casa Fernandez. We knew what these cigars were about. But why did that take so long, maybe, for people to realize what you guys were doing, not just at your farms, but with the cigars you were producing? Well, I think Terrence helped a lot. And my son, Max, also came into the picture. And, and together, they developed the Aganorsa leaf concept. Because we got a little bit lost there with Casa Fernandez. And uh, everybody always asks, what's Aganorsa mean? What's Aganorsa all about? Why do you mention Aganorsa? So uh, coming through with the Aganorsa leaf concept, uh, kind of like brought it all together, no? Uh, Terrence has also done a great job. And obviously, our tobacco also speaks for itself. Uh, every year we get better and our blends also are very good um, the, the uh, lunatic uh, line uh, now the supreme leaf uh, the torch uh, all our products are, are doing very well they have a good launch and, and uh, they keep being repeated and asked for so now we're known before we were not as known right unfortunately but it's hard to crack that nut it's uh, it takes time no? Yeah, no, it does. But, you know, a lot of people knew, knew of stuff going on in your factory. And one thing that I always kind of found that your factories did really well is you, were, you, you kind of had a lot of this new talent coming in. And, you know, they've made the most of – it seems like you guys are providing great mentorship, and they're making the most of that right now. Um, is that, that's something, like, I would say is a real – that's something when I look at what your factories do and, and some of the brands, like, you know, thinking of Dion, you know, is a great example. You guys have, you know, for many years, really have mentored these guys along. Right. Now, Dion uh, came on early, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, Pete Johnson brought him to our factory because we knew him when the relationship with uh, 
with a ping, etc. Right. And uh, he, he suggested that he come to us. No, so he came. Here, I mean, from the beginning, he came to us. Very knowledgeable fellow. Very involved. Gets involved uh, heavily and comes every month and a half uh, in, in the uh, blending and everything else. He knows our tobacco very well. He has also uh, an incredible palate uh, and taste, and is very knowledgeable. So he has helped us a lot, no? And our great tobacco has helped him a lot. Yeah. So all, all, all the tobacco he makes, we make for him. It's all our tobacco, no? So he's been very good. We yeah. brought Nick. Nick, we knew Melillo, and so we've done a few things with him. And Mel, Nick, and the uh, Wednesday, the, the ancient, uh, whatever it's called, I forget now. <laughs> that just got number three, I think, this year. Uh, wise uh, man, um, yeah. Wise man, exactly. Yep. It's, yep. It's a, the old man, I call him. The <laughs> and we have Kyle Gallis, which is a, a young fellow, rising yep. star. He, he got a high rating this time in the top 25. Uh, he's 28 years old. He's very intense, very knows what he wants. You know, again, a unique individual. Uh, we have a new fellow coming on, which is Rainier uh, Lorenzo, HVC, who's hitting the... The, the road hard and, and making a name for himself and he also has a unique quality. We have Viaje, Andre Farkas, keeps up coming with new ideas, new concepts uh, and uh, we, we obviously, uh, thank God we make great blends with him so we work well together. <laughs> uh, he told now, me about how he drove you guys crazy in a factory with some of his ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Andre is a tough individual. You know, sometimes <laughs> great individuals are tough. You're right, right. <laughs> I hate to be his wife. But <laughs> uh, he's a tough cookie. But, you know, he, he knows what he wants and he fights for it. And you have to respect him for that. Good and he's him. very creative. No? Yeah. We also now just, uh, Gurkha just came on board as well. And uh, we made a couple great blends for them. They're very happy. And uh, they've really taken on the Aganorsa name. Now we're coming out with a new one called San Miguel. Uh, and they're very happy, and we're very happy with them as well. No, because they have a great marketing and, and great uh, commercial side to to promote their products. Yeah, and, and you've got to be happy about how the rebranding has gone for you. Um, has it gone? Has it been? Has it? You know, things seem to be going well. Did you? You you've got to be happy with that, right? I mean, right. I think the change really helped a lot. It just uh, it was a huge pop in our business. It just brought it all together. Yeah. And made people realize and let us carry our message forth and people understand it and, you know, register in the mind because it was just a great deal of confusion. What's this Aganorsa? What's all about? You know? Yeah. See, Garafi Serrano has always helped us and been uh, an ally, not an ally, but I mean, friendly to us in the sense of uh, uh, promoting Nicaraguan tobacco in the first place. And uh, they've always been good to us in Aganorsa, no? They like our tobacco and they speak well of it and we're, we get a lot of prizes from them. Um, so it, it's all worked very well, you know? And Terrence has also made it happen, you know? Sometimes things come together, you know? The stars line up. Right. It's your moment in time, you no? Know, or in history. <laughs> or on the grand scene, you no? Know? So we're getting there. Yeah. I mean, I'm smoking the Lunatic uh, torch right now. Um, mm -hmm. I love the size that you came out with in this. Yeah. And I love, I love, I love the packaging and the banding yeah. on this too. It's, it's really, really no, pops it's nice. Like uh, we've, we've made a, a release now and it's basically sold out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this size, uh, this, this is like a Toro size. I'm small. This is really good. Right. I mean, this is like Terrence said tasty. That's like, that's a, yeah, that's an understatement. It's really good. Uh, yeah. This is just this cigar. How can I just say it's 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 Aganorsa to the core. Like if this right. is what I think of Aganorsa, I think this is really a great representation of that cigar right now. Yeah, yeah. Our taste is unique. People can recognize and say yeah. Aganorsa. Yeah. Taste or whatever. No. Yeah. I mean, and um, you know, like I said, twenty. You know, what Nick? What's happening in Nicaragua right now? It's a. Uh, it's a. You know, Nicaragua has become the leading country, and uh, you guys are right at the forefront of that. Yeah. Yeah, we're happy to be in that group. And uh, Nicaraguan tobacco speaks for itself. It's great tobacco. No? And yeah. uh, Cuba has, not, not, not that it's lost its luster. It never, it never will because of the land and the people. But it, uh, they, they take too many shortcuts because of economic reasons. And also, they follow the party line. They don't follow the, the, the people with knowledge. No? The, the, the politics get involved. So um, to me, it's, it's not the same as it used to be. Yeah, I understand that. 
and, and you mentioned you mentioned Max, um, and Max has really in the last few years, um, he's emerging as a force now as well on the blending end and what he's doing. I think it's a, right. he's, yeah, doing he's some a great, great blender. He has that yeah. natural gift. He picked up on Arsenio and then uh, he's gone from there. I was very worried when Arsenio left us that, that would leave a huge hole no? yeah. in terms of our blending capacity, but he just picked up and never looked back. He's also very good in the uh, uh, internet, uh, would I say, uh, labeling and uh, creating the trademarks. He created the lunatic. Uh, he helped a lot in, in obviously in the Aganorsa Leaf uh, uh, relaunch, et cetera, no? and, and new things that we're doing. He's very much involved in that end as well. He has that uh, a gift in that side as well. Very good, very good. Aaron, do you have anything else for Eduardo? Sorry, I was on mute. I think you hit it all. Okay. Um, Eduardo, before we go, can we just kind of talk about what we're smoking with you? Um, and um, we do, like I said, thanks very much for the time, but can we talk about what we're smoking here? Okay. Well, you're smoking the torch. The torch, uh, when you begin, it doesn't have the cover. So you're smoking right. basically more of a Corojo blend at the very mm -hmm. beginning for like a quarter or half an inch. And then the cover leaf comes into effect. So it's a play on, you know, a little bit of Smoking a cigar without a cover leaf, with a, without the, the great Corojo influence, and then with it uh, fully. It's a three quarter uh, strength blend. That's what I put it up. Representative at. of our leaf, you know, very tasty, it's well rounded, uh, complex. Uh, it's a good cigar overall. No? It, it really is. I get that three quarter strength is exactly where I put it at. It's, it's great balance on this, but you get some of that Nicaraguan spice. There's a nice underlying sweetness with it. Uh, neither are right. aggressive on you. That's the, play, that's the interplay between the Criollo and the Corojo. Yeah, it, it's, it's fantastic. Criollo gives you that spice, and yeah. the Corojo gives you that sweetness. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I and I, I had liked the yeah I had liked the original torch with the thinner ringgit, but I think it I like this size better. Um, full it's, size, huh? Yeah, I like this size. Yeah, smoke. A, yeah, I got to try the seventy. I do I do like smoking big ring gauge cigars. So oh, um, yeah, yeah, we have uh, a whole gamut of those, and they yeah, no. like gangbusters. <laughs> <laughs> you have the eighty, the eighty. <laughs> Paul Paul gave me the uh, I remember Paul gave me the uh, eight by eighty, and uh, what I liked about that is it had the bellicoso tip, so I didn't yeah. feel like I was smoking the eighty with that. Right. Uh, right. It, don't get me wrong. It was a. Yeah. It was a. Funny enough, I smoke. created that because I said this cigar has to be friendly to the mouth. <laughs> right. <laughs> we all appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. No. It, it, yeah. yeah. But it it made a big difference. Actually, I don't think that would have been the same if I didn't. Ha it wouldn't have been as a. It was much more of a. Uh, the smoking experience was just better with that. Yeah. That cigar surprised me because I thought it would be sold in you know specific areas of the country or whatever because of its big size, etc. But I even saw it in Davidoff on, uh, on Madison Avenue. No? So that when I saw that, I said, holy shit. <laughs> I, said, I think an 880 would be sold in New York City at top stores. No? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like I said, I... Uh, I, I you can't keep it off the table. So, yeah. It, you know, you know what we're having now a lot of successes with the local series. Yeah. We created a local 60, a 70, and an 80. The 80 was my idea because, you know, we make 80s, let's say... Hey, uh, you kind of have to hold it with two hands because you can't, you know, put it in your mouth and, and let it sit there. But uh, it's a very tasty cigar. It's got the new Corojo uh, Maduro wrapper, and it's got, a, again, a full flavor of Aganorsa uh, tobacco. And it's very popular. I'm surprised because it's a, you know, it's a perfecto. It's not a, a volume cigar, but again, we can't keep it off the table, which is great. It's at a value price. Yeah. Uh, very reasonable for the quality of the, uh, the tobacco. <laughs> yeah, very true. And now Aaron's... what Aaron is smoking, the uh, Supreme Leaf, that mm -hmm. just took off like a bandit. We did a release and it just sold out and everybody got kind of upset. I, uh, come on, I can't get some. <laughs> well, we they tried. Kind of it. The, the Terrence led us on a wild goose were. chase for it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming back. It's coming back. But again, that took us by surprise. You know, it's totally uh, off on us, the color. Uh, the brightness of the tobacco and uh, you know it, it, uh, it, again it's it's a, it, it's a great cigar and it'll do great things for us so it's good that we can keep coming up with new things that do well no it didn't used to be that way sometimes yeah it's a really smooth cigar um the the depth of the the wood and the the earthy notes to it um really mellow spice i was i'd say maybe medium strength in regards to it but yeah 
Um, one of the things I love about egg and horse tobacco is the really clean finish. Like it doesn't really, it doesn't punish your palate where you no. kind of can taste it for a while, you know, in between draws. And then after you're done smoking the cigar, it's, it's very clean. So you, know, you can, you smoke that cigar and you're like, okay, I'm ready for another cigar. So like, I need to take a little bit of a break to let my palate reset. It's just, it's a really, you know, it's, it, it kind of contains itself to the experience, which is nice. Yeah, Aaron, we're very cognizant of the taste, like I mentioned, no, and the flavors. To us, it's extremely important. Two, uh, we don't, don't like dry cigars, and our leaf right. also provides, a, some are gushers. <laughs> Actually, Dion says it's like a gusher. Your, your, your mouth waters sometimes when you smoke a cigar. What you should never do, he taught me uh, from day one, is not have a, a glass of, of water on the side, and by the time you finish the cigar, you drink the, the glass. Exactly. That's you, that you're smoking a dry cigar. So we're lucky in that regard that our land and our, our process uh, uh, does, does not provide for, you know, very dry cigar. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I got to mention one more cigar, um, which I didn't. And I think one thing that you guys aren't known for this wrapper, but it was, this was a home run in my book. And I normally don't like a Boulder, Connecticut. But the Aganorsa mm -hmm. Leaf Connecticut is one I really like. Yeah, uh, it's great. You guys just knocked that one out of the park, in my, opi in my opinion. I really love that cigar. Right. Now, there's some stores, some very important stores that love it. Yeah. There, we play it off against the Corojo because uh, Connecticut has, um, you know, a bit of a taste. I wouldn't call it bitter, but, you know, a little bit uh, a specific taste. So uh, with the Corojo, we're able to take that away, you know, and, and add uh, – subtle strength because obviously Connecticut should not be that strong because most people that smoke Connecticut are not looking for a strong cigar overall you know it'd be a surprise if they get it you know one that's you know I mean you can do it but it's to me it's not proper no uh, because the, the, the smoker that that goes for Connecticut is looking for a medium blend a little bit above but not super strong no right same as a Maduro Maduro should be a strong cigar I mean the, the leaf itself the darkness and all that represents strength character personality so it should not be a, a low-end uh, strength cigar, in my opinion, no? No, I can tell you with the Night Watch, that's a very bold cigar. Right. Yeah, yeah there we use against the, uh, the, the, the Corojo uh, Shade Grown. No, it made it different. Yeah, it's really, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's got some, but it's got flavor with it, too, which is what I really like. Yeah. But I didn't expect, but that, well, like, I've had some Guardian strong... has been terrific for us. That was a, an invention of Max and Kyle. And the dog still exists. In fact, he's in my house right now. Oh, he's really? Because <laughs> uh, we have uh, dogs that guard the different farms. Not, you know, they're not going to attack you, but they bark and they, you know, they, they have a scary presence. Uh, so based on that, between them and the love of dogs, they decided. When I initially heard the concept, it didn't seem to me to have a, a ring with a dog, you know, in the yeah. face and, and be called a guardian of the farm. <laughs> but it worked well from day one. So uh, I never looked back on that either. Keeps being, you know, one of our favorites. That's great. That's great. Well, right. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I said, uh, you know, I've had some strong cigars from from you guys over the years. Uh, but that one was like, wow, that's 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 um, that's a strong that one was very strong. Uh, mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Yeah. All right, Eduardo, uh, that, that wraps up the interview piece. We wanted to thank you very, very much uh, for being a part of the show. Um, honor to talk to you. Um, thanks for all the support you have given us uh, over the years. We do appreciate that as well. I've gotten to know Terrence and Paul very well over the years. So uh, mm -hmm. they're two great friends. And um, you know, really, really was an honor to talk to you. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks for inviting me. And thanks for the support that you've shown no, and the interest in Naganorsa. So yeah. to both you and Aaron, uh, you know, we're glad to be here and, and make a yeah. presence and, and tell us about our, our leaf and what Aganorsa is all about to you. Yep. I don't want to forget Max audience. either. Yeah, I don't want to forget Max either. Max is also great yeah. uh, as well. Uh, yeah. learned a lot from okay. Yep. Eduardo, thank you so much for being yes, on the show. Uh, look, for, Hopefully we'll see you sometime down the road soon. Um, yeah, not um, at the RTDA, unfortunately. Uh, not this year. <laughs> not this year. But stay, please stay safe in Nicaragua for us. Okay. All right. Same with you. All Thanks right. You Thanks again, guy. Thanks again, Eduardo. That's, right. that's Eduardo Fernandez of um, Aganorsa Leaf. Uh, we're going to do a couple more segments here. Uh, Terrence, you going to stick around for us? Well, if you'll have me, I'll be happy to stick around. 
Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to do a, a word from the sponsors first. And I did want to mention uh, what we were smoking tonight is sponsored by Tailored Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's Epicenter. Tailored Smoke is your uh, non uh, one-stop shop for a tailored smoking experience. And now they are open uh, for grab and go at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Um, so want to, uh, you know, and they're, they're big supporters of Ag and Arsa Leaf too. So uh, I get a lot of my cigars from them there. Uh, also want to mention Villager Cigars. Since 1888, Villager Cigars have been experts in everything tobacco, including offering a wide range of premium cigars for all connoisseurs. Villager's La Vencedor, which translates to the victor, is the first ever full-bodied Villager Cigar, and it carries a special meaning to Villager Cigars Chairman of Board Heinrich Villager. The Villager La Vencedor, or the victor, represents to Mr. Villager the arrival of, to the premium high-end cigar segment. It was time, in his opinion, to push the envelope and create a legacy cigar that will serve as a proper follow-up to the highly acclaimed Villager La Floridian Clan brand. This Nicaraguan Puro wrapped in a beautiful Nicaraguan Habano Oscuro wrapper boasts a full-bodied smoky experience featuring highly seasoned and hearty flavors. Be sure to ask your retailer for La Aventador, and you can visit Villegas' entire line of premium cigars at www.villegascigars.com. And by uh, JRE Tobacco. The authentic Coro leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars because it is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate. It fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastron Valley of Honduras, Julio Arro took on the challenge of growing Coro from the original seeds, and in 2000, he reintroduced authentic Coro back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business, from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the JRE Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corojo. Now with JRE Tobacco, Julio and Husto bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Corojo leaf. Tadascam is a mild and medium cigar in both Connecticut and Habano Rapa. Rancho Luna is a premium medium cigar available in Habano and Maduro. And Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Corojo Puro, San Andreas Maduro, and Ecuadorian Connecticut shade. Uh, representing the golden age of cigars in Cuba from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer, be sure to ask for JRE Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Toscano Cigars, as rustic and strong as the people who smoke them, try Toscano's rustic and full-bodied flavors and aromas. Made in Italy with 100% dark fire-cured tobacco from the United States and Italy, it's one of the best-selling cigars in the world. Toscano Cigars are the perfect combination of American and Italian craftsmanship. Whether in the traditional long format or in the short format Toscanella, Toscano Cigars are dry-cured, handmade, and fire-cured for your enjoyment anytime, anywhere. Visit your local premium cigar retailer today and look for Toscano Cigars today. And by A.J. Fernandez Cigars. A.J. Fernandez's new world brand is named in honor of the discovery of tobacco by Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. A.J. collaborated with his father, Ishmael, on the cigar, which is compromised of a wrapper, to comprised of a wrapper from Nicaragua that covers binder from the Lapa Valley over a filler blend of Ometepe, Condega, and Esteli tobaccos. The core line debuted in 2014, which was followed by New World Connecticut, New World Puro Especial, and New World Cameroon. All four blends are able to captivate the palate of any cigar smoker. If you're beginning to discover the fine world of premium handmade cigars, New World Connecticut's for you. If you're into the rich full body blends, Pearl Especial's for you. And if you're into complex flavors, New World Cameroon is for you. If you're into robust and earthy flavors with notes of espresso, the New World Oscuro is definitely for you. Visit www.ajfcigars.com to learn more. And by Embon Bay Cigars. Embon Bay Cigars are represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. Embon Bay Cigars are rolled in Costa Rica by some of the world's most experienced cigar rolls, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try Embon Bay and the Gaia line. Embon Bay Cigars, where a cigar is a way of life. And by Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley. Visit alecbradley.com to find out more about their cigars, Live True. And we're going to get into our Alec Bradley Live True segment, of course, sponsored by Alec Bradley. We take a little break from the uh, hardcore cigar talk here, and we get into uh, just things that maybe talk about in the cigar lounge. Um, and I think this weekend, Aaron, it was a, a grilling weekend, right? Yes. For a lot of us. Um, and... I was kind of curious, just kind of going around, like when, when people grill, what kind of grills the people use? So, so I'll, I'll kind of start off with our guests if they want to tell us if they, what kind of grill they use. Terrence, you're on a more, high rise, so it's kind of tricky, I guess. I'm more, I'm more of an eater. Like I eat the food that's grilled. That's yeah. more my thing. And, right. so, uh, and so there's a lot of guys in the industry who are who do an amazing job, you know, Carney, obviously, and, and uh, my buddy uh, Brian McGee. He does a tri-tip, which is outstanding. So I'm more of a person that likes to eat the food that people put on the grill. 
How about you, Aaron? All right, Eduardo, do you use a grill? Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> Vegetables and meat, obviously. Right. Do you use like a charcoal grill or an electric grill or a uh, ga excuse, gas grill? Yeah, wood or charcoal. The old yeah. traditional. <laughs> yep. Yeah. How about you, Aaron? Uh, I have three. Um, I have a gas grill. I have an electric smoker, and I also have a uh, a Weber kettle that um, I've added a, a smoker attachment to, so I can do, you know, charcoal grilling, or I could do smoking on there with wood or charcoal. So, um, just depending on the job is is what I'll go to. Okay, I uh, my wife won't let me get a gas grill, <laughs> um, because she's very worried about propane around the house for whatever reason. So um, I, I have the old standby with charcoal, um, but I just purchased an electric infrared grow. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar what, what this infrared is going to do, except my wife just bought it for me, so it's coming. <laughs> so I have no idea what it's going to do, but, she's, uh, but the charcoal is a little bit of a pain sometimes, um, particularly, when, uh, particularly when you have to clean it up afterwards, unfortunately. The, the food you were cooking looked pretty delicious. That was. That was, uh, and that was the Cattle Baron Burgers from Montana, actually, that meat. So that meat came from uh, the Cattle Baron guys at Montana. Nice. Uh, and we bought some really good chicken with it. Um, I'm not known for culinary, but I guess by default, the man barbecue or grills. So that's kind of like my role. <laughs> so, uh, the problem is now I was told I have to cut back on red meat by the doctor. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I won't get into that, but uh, I'm sure if Abe's <laughs> listening, he's going to be giving me a lecture. Um, but yeah, I, but I was told I have to cut back. <laughs> I was told this last week. So, uh, uh, that, you know, it could lead to bad things is what they said. But they didn't say I had to give it up, which is good. Moderation. Yeah. So do you, uh, what kind of, what kind of foods, Terrence, do you like on, like, as an eater, what do you like on that, on a grill? You know, whatever you do that you do well, usually that's what I'll say to somebody is, you know, if you do a, a mean tri-tip like McGee, well, that's what I want to eat. If you do, uh, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers, if that's your forte, then I'm good. I, I'm mostly very appreciative if I'm not cooking. So if you're the one that's putting the food together and it's, uh, you know, usually that's the, what you do well and that's what I, I enjoy eating. Have you ever had tri-tip? I never had it until M McGee. Uh, I, I haven't. I'm going to be honest. I don't think I've had it now that you're saying that. I guess it's a big uh, West Coast thing. but it's It is. Not big it's a big, Californ big California thing. Yeah. yeah. Why, why is it a California thing? Is, is there any reason? I just think it? that the, the butchers out here, you know, kind of, I think they came up with the cut um, and then it just kind of grew out here. Um, so there's various areas that have like kind of specialties and in, in how they make it and things like that. So like uh, Santa Maria is a big thing. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I think it's just a different cut that is more popular out here. Aaron, tell me about these smokers that you have. Cause you seem like I, I know very little about the smokers. Yeah. So, I mean, um, with a smoker, you're just mainly looking for indirect cooking. So you're not going to put the meat over the, the heat source. So it's going to be away from the heat. Um, so you, there's many ways to do it. Uh, electric smokers you can use, um, which are, it's like, it's like also like a, a mini fridge kind of a setup and you have multiple racks in there and it's just an electric uh, kind of heating element towards the bottom. And um, you can add wood to that to kind of create the smoke. It's not as if you, you know, try something out of an electric smoker versus a, out of a, you know, a wood or a charcoal smoker. It's not going to be exactly the same, but you can get you know, kind of close. Um, but otherwise, you know, you're going to use something where you have uh, – you know, kind of a, a smoke box where you have the heat coming from there and the wood that's you're smoking from, and uh, the heat is transferring from that area to the area that's further away where you have the meat uh, at. So if you're doing um, briskets or whatever that way, um, that's typically the way you, you set it up. And the, a lot of the fun is trying out, you know, different ways to do it. So different, uh, you know, if you use charcoal uh, briquettes or if you use um, like lump charcoal, um, and then the type of wood that you use for the smoking is a big is a big deal as well. So, you know, everybody's heard of like hickory or mesquite, but you can use like apple or cherry or alder or olive. There's you know any number of woods that you can use to do the smoking, and some some of the different woods work better with different types of meat. So, 
Um, if you're doing like uh, poultry or something like that, you don't want to use an aggressive wood like a, like a hickory or a mesquite because it'll kind of overpower the, the chicken or the turkey or whatever you're doing. Um, so you want to go with a, kind of a lighter wood. But uh, if you're doing beef or something like that um, or pork, you can go a little bit more aggressive on the wood. I've noticed that smokers tend to, the people that, that smoke food tend to be very particular about what wood or how to do it. Yeah. They seem to judge, they, they judge you a lot if you don't use it the way that they think you should. I think it's the same way with anything. Like, you know, there are certain people that have very strict thoughts on how things should be done, but really you get the, I think the fun of it is uh, experimenting, you know, trying different, different woods and things like that to kind of get, find out what flavors you like. So um, I think it's just like cigars, you know, you, you do what you like. And uh, if people, other people have a complaint about it, they don't have to eat it, I guess. So um, I think you just do what you want to do and, and see what you like and that works. But uh, yeah, there's some people that are, are you know, brutal, really strict into what they, what you think they, they think you should be doing with it. So smoking, or smoking meats should be a judgment free activity. Absolutely. Yep. If you like the taste, Smoke it however you want. That's how I see I like, it. I like the way you think. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, you were mentioning those, what I had in that picture, Terrence, like those, those steaks were like, like basically trimmings of like skirt steak trimmings, right? That we just threw on there, right? For the hell of it, right? Just because we had them and like, oh, we just, we, uh, we were just like looking to clear out the freezer and stuff. And they actually, with the indirect heat, we put, the, they came out pretty good, actually. Uh, I was, no, it looked, looked pretty good. I, I said I was surprised. I wasn't expecting much from it. It was figured it was burgers and chicken was like going to be the plan with that. So uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm pretty traditional. Uh, I like I like burgers. I like sausage. Uh, the Tony Soprano sausages on the grill. I call them. Uh, um, I haven't had a panic attack and passed out, but uh, <laughs> I think he did. But uh, yeah. Um, so that was that was uh, interesting. I actually want as long as we got Terrence on here, Aaron. Right. Yep. Um, and I'm going to mention a cattle barn meat moment. Um, Terrence, you took an unfair pounding, okay? And I want to clear the air on this, on that, on that cheesesteak. Because yes, I don't think uh, we've had a chance. I, don't I, think we I have... still haven't gotten over this, to be honest. So, so always, let, so. Me, let me make this clear. Terrence went to a top five cheesesteak place in, in Philadelphia. Steve's Prince of Steaks would be on a list I would recommend to anybody on the short list to go to. It's not necessarily number one, but it's in my top five. Um, so I want it clear that Terrence didn't just go seek out a very bad cheesesteak here. Um, and regardless of what the picture looked like, Terrence, um, that was a very good cheesesteak. It was cyberbullying at its worst, I thought. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I was all happy. I went to a, a couple of local guys at a shop were like, hey, we want to take you to one of the best places you can get a cheesesteak. Oh, it is, yeah. And uh, you know, I thought it was delicious and I had a great time. And, you know, I post the picture and I didn't take, you know, that much effort to, you know, really take a great picture yeah. of it. And, uh, and I've never heard the end of it ever. So it's, uh, <laughs> the, the, it's the very pro- upsetting. Yeah. The problem was, and, and, and I'll defend the dojo guys a little, they went to John's roast pork, which I would put number one on the list to be honest. It, it, it doesn't look like much of a place, but it is really good. But I'll just say whatever that, however that picture came out, I'm not going to judge it. Uh, because I, I bet it was a, that. yeah, I bet it was a good cheat because again, they, they didn't do you wrong. You went to, like I said, what I would consider a top five place in Philadelphia. And people could argue this one's better than that. But I don't think anyone would put Steve's as like, don't go to Steve's or anything like that. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> because uh, I, I was, it was like coming from every direction. He's still, he's still, it's still in a topic of discussion a year later. I'm like, I, God. I need sleeping pills to go to bed at night. <laughs> right. Because right. of how of how upset I was after the, the berating that went on after <laughs> I have from, from people that people that I thought were my friends. I thought they were my friends. I don't know. Uh, uh, look, look, they're good guys. They know, they know their cheesesteaks, um, but they have not in fairness. I don't know if they've been to Steve's um, and I haven't been to Steve's in a, in, in a probably about two or three years, maybe three years at least, but I guess it's a solid, it's a place I would, re- I would certainly go to. Um, and I can't judge the pictures all I'm going to say. Sometimes I've had food at places sometimes that don't, photograph well either and i you know and i'm not even faulting you for taking the picture so i'm gonna have you back on this one then but it was a good was it a good cheesesteak that's a you know it was great man it was delicious i thought i thought i thought it was excellent and and it was uh you know i was so happy and and proud that i got to you know be in philly and have a you know a cheesesteak from a renowned place and and then uh and then 10 minutes later i was questioning my entire life 
no, no. I will say I do want you to do, go to John's Roast Pork, um, and I will give you your money back if you don't like that cheesesteak, personally. No, I believe you. I'm going to go there. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, be there. Yeah, don't you yeah, worry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all good. Um, but, yeah, you can say And it's funny because Pat's and Gino's is what everyone knows. I get it. Right. They're right. Yep. They're, they're, they're better than what you're going to get in most places, but there's places Which I would – the there's one in the airport, which is, it's, it's just, a, it's a, one of the locations, but there's one of them that has a location in the airport. Is it Pat's? I can't remember. I thought it was Gino's. I thought it was. Maybe Gino's. it's Gino's. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It it's G one of the two. It's one of the two. Yeah. I don't remember it either. Uh, but the, the thing about those places were when I lived in Jersey uh, and I was going to school at Rutgers, we would go down there on a Saturday night and get there at like one in the morning for a cheesesteak. Um, I mean, you can go to, you know, cause they're open, tw they were open 24 seven. I don't remember if some of the other places are. I know John's Roast Pork is in a twenty four seven place. I think there's a couple of others, but those places you knew it was always uh twenty uh, twenty four seven, and we'd go to both places and usually split the cheese steaks up that way. Well, well, yeah. So just wanted to wanted to clear the record here. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad we got that out. I'm yeah, glad. yeah. I love Eric and Jordan, but they really got a, got on your case with that one. And several others. It wasn't just them. They were the worst, but uh, there were several other Randy yeah. gigs. And uh, it was very upsetting to see so many people I thought were friends uh, yeah. just attack me in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, Terrence, first, you know, we're going to do one more segment, but I wanted to actually talk a little. Um, first up, thanks again for, for arranging for Eduardo to be on. Uh, uh, that, was, that was a big uh, treat for us. So we do really appreciate that as well. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, he's a guy I've been wanting to talk to for a long time and, and uh, certainly didn't disappoint there. You're happy, I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. And, yeah. and, Aaron, and if Aaron's happy, too. Yeah. And I'm Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we share a sentiment. You're doing a, you're doing a good job there. So, yeah. No, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very, very kind yeah. of you to say. Yeah, so this, 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 this torch, um, I just wanted to comment on this a little more. Um, I do really like the size in it. Um, and I, obviously, I think the, the packaging was an upgrade on it, too. So I think you guys nailed it with this cigar. Yeah, Max was mostly responsible for the packaging. Uh, this, the, and the size of the thing with the original size was that it, uh, it had more of, a, instead of the brush foot, it had a shaggy foot. And it was, it was much longer. Yes. And, and so that kind of had an impact on it, too, because the idea is ultimately that you want to taste the, the fillers and binders and get it. And that kind of wakes up the palate. And you get a sense for that. But you don't want to be smoking that for a half hour. And with the original one, you were smoking the, the, the shaggy foot for, for quite a bit. And I think it, people lost a little patience with that. So we wanted to bring it down a little and put it in sizes that we thought were going to be more, more appealing as well. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, it, it, I do like the, the – I'm going to make sure because I always mix – this has the, shag, the shaggy foot on, not the brush foot. This is the brush foot. The shaggy foot. Oh, I always more, mix the two up. Yeah. It has, the, the, brush has the, like the jutting tobacco coming out. It, right. It almost looks like a, a broom kind of. And then this is just the, the wrapper is removed from the first uh, half inch in this case. So it's, a, it's, a, it's also a little cleaner that way. That's and what I was going to say. More, yeah. You get more a consistent lot. flavor. Um, whereas it, with the tobacco jut, jutting out all over the place, it looks cool. But uh, it's, it's, I think the experience is not as, as fulfilling. Yep. It um the other thing like I said it, it I tend to burn a shirt a lot of times with a with a brush foot is the yeah, best yeah I, I will yeah I just usually will find a way to to get ash on my shirt badly with those uh, but yeah I like how it transitions to the wrapper uh, you definitely get that it's a it's a it's a like I said very very agonorser cigar um, to say the least yeah it's a, we we released it to uh, the the participants of our Agonorsa Select program. So they're the ones that have it right now and it'll be a more widely available this summer to, to others. So it's, uh, but so far reception has been really good. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback and people seem to be really excited about it. So that's good. That's the whole name of the game. I want yep. people to enjoy it. That's true. And this was going to be something, obviously it's going to be available to everyone at some point. Or yeah, this, this, this summer it's going it, to, we're going to open it up to everybody. We've been trying to, uh, the people that's, you know, that, are really dedicated to Agonorsa and, and uh, are really helping uh, promote us and, and, uh, and spread the good word, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it. Um, we have a program that they can partake in and, uh, and those that do, we want a reward for that. So uh, right now it's just them, but we will open it up to everybody. 
Very good. Very good. Aaron, anything else? Wait, well, no, kind of, I kind of diverged a little on that no, segment. I think you're good. Okay. Uh, Terrence, I'm going to do one round of breaks, and then we'll uh, – we have one last segment on catalog brands. Uh, can you stick around for that? Sure, absolutely. If you'll have Great. me. Uh, we absolutely want you. Absolutely want you. So uh, let me mention uh, our sponsors here. Uh, with Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Master Blender Steve Saka set out to create Puroson Compromiso, cigars without compromise. This represents an expression of Saka's closely held values and attests in three simple words everything Saka wants to accomplish. Cigars are more than a passion for Saka. They are a way of life. As for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Sober Mesa, Mi Querida, Umbagad, Moesto de Saka, Todos Los Dias, and Sin Compromiso at your local tobacconist. And by La Aurora Cigars. In the heart of Santiago, Dominican Republic, on the rolling floor at La Aurora Cigar Factory is a section reserved only for the elite, the best of the best. These elite cigar rollers work for over 10 years to simply get the opportunity to make a historic cigar. Those cigars are the La Aurora Preferitos. Featuring six different wrappers and a beautifully packaged Perfecto shape, La Aurora Preferitos have been the preferred family of the Leon family for over 115 years. Take part in a legendary tradition that started the Dominican cigar industry. Look to the lion. La Aurora Cigars, we are Dominican-defined. And by J.C. Newman Cigar Company, founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman. J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and 125 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting many of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in an iconic 109-year-old-plus cigar factory in the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District in Tampa, Florida. At this factory known as El Rahol, J.C. Newman rolls premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique machines. The J.C. Newman Pensive Factory is the second largest in Nicaragua. It's where Brickhouse, Perla del Mar, El Baton, and Quorum cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus, Julius Caesar, and Diamond, Black Diamond cigars are handmade by Tobacco Lar A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With its longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newmans have founded the Cigar Family, Channel, Channel, <laughs> Cigar family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic with education, health care, vocational training, and clean water. Visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has four generations of cigar experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of the Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now the Cuevas family brings a very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. Try the Casa Cuevas Connecticut, the Casa Cuevas Habano, and the Cuevas Maduro, as well as a recent released Cuevas Reserva line. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cuevas from our casa to yours. And by Cigar Marketplace. Cigar Marketplace is the first B2B premium cigar and accessories online broker that connects premium cigars to retailers, simplifying the way our industry does business. Retailers can now directly order from the suppliers they want without the wait, getting the customers the brands they demand. Wholesalers no longer need to depend on going store to store to find the retailer that fits their brand. This allows retailers to enjoy a one-stop shopping experience for all their store needs. With an optional monthly subscription of $39.99, it allows members to benefit from all order-free shipping, 40% off second day air rates, 2.5% cash back every six months. They refer a friend to program, set discount off 10% naked bundles, and exclusive weekly deals. Non members can take advantage of Cigar Marketplace exclusive deals plus free shipping on orders over $750. Visit www.cigarmarketplace.co to learn more. Um, just a couple, I guess I'll just mention this real quick because uh, I mentioned. Um, I did mention La Aurora Cigars a few times, uh, actually, just now. Uh, the Manuel and Noah show, which was scheduled for um, last week, uh, we had to reschedule because Manuel wasn't feeling well. Manuel's doing better. And we have that confirmation back. He will be doing the uh, June 18th show. So, um, and I know, Aaron, you have uh, Bobby Newman coming up on a show as well. Yeah, we'll be doing a, a show on uh, Thursday, June 11th uh, with Bobby Newman and uh, the guys from uh, Horse Soldier Bourbon um, and Jeff Borshevitz as well. So we'll be doing a, a bourbon and uh, the American uh, pairing show. That's excellent. Excellent. Um, and then as long as we're just doing the programming, so I'll mention uh, next week, uh, Bear and I are doing special edition 77. We have Phil Zengi coming on. Uh, so make sure you have some caffeine uh, on that show. <laughs> And then uh, next uh, next Thursday, primetime 141, uh, Laurel Tilly from Macanudo is coming on. So uh, you, you'll want to stay tuned for those shows next week. Okay, um, I want to talk a little about um, catalog, catalog brands. Um, and, you know, this is always a touchy subject, I guess, in, in the cigar business. Um, I don't know. I don't know about everyone else, but um, – I want to mention this catalog and internet sales um, because lately, as you know, um, with everything going on in the world, I think a lot of people are turning to internet sales 
And uh, I know I have been um, doing more of that. Um, and, and I'm not saying that, and I'll say all internet sales are not the same. You know, I think you have, on one hand, you have catalogs, the big catalog companies, but I think you have these other ones who are like extensions of brick and mortars right. that basically they have an, it's like an online kiosk for like be, be, better word to put it. You know, for example, cigar shop is one tailored smoke just started. theirs. Uh, Neptune cigar down in uh, Miami is one I've used, uh, you know, use Corona. We use Corona, I should say as well. Smoke in. So I, I think there's differences there. Would you guys agree that there's like, when it comes to, catalog and internet there there's a separation with those two yeah i think that's fair to say yeah do you yeah i i think it's just more what what do you what do you audience are you gearing for what specific audience are you looking to, to speak to or or audiences so in some some cases you know if you look at some guys that are really focused on boutique and smaller runs and and more you know rare things or uh stuff that's hard to you know just generally find and then other guys or have everything from you want bundles, we got bundles. You you want uh, you know premium, we got premium. So I think it's more of a of how how wide the audience you're talking to is. Have you guys seen a? And I agree with you, Terrence, on that. Have you guys seen a? I I, I almost feel like whenever I've seen some companies, some retailers start an online piece they almost get like the evil eye like yes. before covid like why do you guys think that was why is that such the case um because like i said in now i think there's retailers i guarantee that wish they had that piece in place oh yeah now they're kind of you know because i don't know I, i've mentioned it grab and go and curbside i don't think has taken off at some stores I, I just don't see it happening all the stores that some stores it has been but I, from what i've seen it just hasn't replaced either going into the store or then just hey you know what i don't want to take a chance leaving the house i, I can just place the order and have it shipped to me right yeah i I, th I think it's it's kind of divided in the sense that if, if your store is more of an experienced based store where if you look at like uh a, a nat sherman in New York, you know, uh, Jeff at Corona is where the whole experience of being there is a huge part of the attraction. I think that is is a, is tougher to have grab and go than it is for stores that might have a lounge and may have people hanging out, but tend to be more a convenient stop. So I've heard I've heard both. I've heard some shops say, you know what, I'm thinking about uh, reducing lounge space. Our numbers really aren't off that much and then i've heard other people say yeah grab and go has done almost nothing for me and I, I i haven't been able to i can't wait till we open yeah i've seen that too um i i, I agree with you on the experience piece because i think um that is that that i i find if the if the online retailer extends that experience to the the you know the store experience to what they're doing online, it, it's, it's good. For example, there's two examples. Like they, like Abe always, they put the handwritten note in there. Yep. Um, Abe doesn't do it all anymore because it got to be too much, but someone is at least doing that. Um, and, and, I, and it's a little thing, but I know I appreciate it. Yeah. Again, I, I mean, McDonald's and Morton's are both restaurants. I mean, they're, but they're geared to do so two different things. I think it's important that you know what you're trying to do. I think that's a big part of it. Like if, if you're, if you're more of a, a convenience based business where people are coming in because it's on the way home or, or, uh, or whatever the, the, the reason is, and it's not as much to hang out, just putting a lounge in, I don't think necessarily improves you, you know, improves your place. Um, whereas if you're really building an overall experience, the lounge is an aspect of that, obviously. Um, but it's not, it, it can't be just, just that. I think that you need to, I think you're going to see more and more pushing in one direction or the other. You're going to see guys that are really going to try to take more, take a more convenience based approach and more, and, and I don't, that's not, a, that's not like convenience store, but it's going to be more of like, okay, I, I can go on the way home and they can, I can, you know, call in advance and they'll run it out to my car. And that's perfect for me because where I smoke is on the golf course or at home or whatever. 
And then there are other places, I mean, cigar bars are the most obvious example, but the, not specifically them where the whole reason of going there is to go inside and to interact and to either have a drink or, or be taken care of uh, by the staff or, or whatever it is. And so you're going to see a push further in each of those directions. I think it'll be harder to kind of just sit in the middle than it used to be. Yeah, I, and I, I agree with that. And you brought up McDonald's, right? And I think there's a really good analogy that I was just thinking about before the show on this. Like, with McDonald's, like, not that I'm a McDonald's fan, but, like, if I'm going to order McDonald's, right, now you have an option where you can get it delivered to your house, right? But you're going to wait, like, an hour to get it. Like, you're not going to get it for at least an hour, right? So in that case, I could see a grab-and-go option as a little more – a viable because you know if you don't want to wait an hour for hamburger and there's a mcdonald's near you, you you can go there and do that well as with a cigar unless i want that cigar like right now to come and smoke right away um grab and go is not necessarily an option unless i'm staying there to smoke it in the lounge and most of the lounges have been closed right now so i think i think while the cigar industry's tried with grab and go it's not it's it's a, it's a different model i think yeah we also have to keep in mind that there's no other option you like you can't if, you, if your store is an open the other store isn't open most likely either so i think that that has to be taken into account too yeah because right now when if you say okay well we're going to get rid of the lounge because it doesn't really seem to be hurting our business well the guys that want to hang on the lounge are going to go right. to wherever there is a lounge that they can hang out in so right we'll lose that business so uh, i mean that has to be factored in but 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 i think again ultimately it just comes down to what what are you what are you trying to accomplish you guys have used internet terrence you've used it i think in your career at casada and now at at aganarsa where you've come up with some of these like special releases and they're available obviously in the store but you know it gives people an opportunity like i'm thinking of the federal cigar releases are a good example um the, some of the dojo cigars you've done where you know people nationwide want to experience this as a cigar smoker and sometimes it's just not as easy to do it and the easiest way to do it is place the order online so I think you guys have done a good job with, with some of that as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I, again, ultimately the, I mean, one of the things I always say about how important convenience is to some degree is that if you look at a place that doesn't have a good parking lot, that's almost always a bad sign. Uh, yeah. Because it's like uh, I, people will drive by, they don't see a spot. They're not going to drive around with, to get a spot. They're, they're just going to keep oh. going. And if they have to go off, off their path and they drive by a couple of times, and it's it's filled they stop they stop going out of their way so you that's i think that that's a you know important thing to, to keep in mind is that people are gonna are gonna do what's convenient for them and and then is your business filling that need so if, if you if you can provide internet and that fits and you can provide it like you said in your model where like smoking putting in a card or uh, Provada Cigar Club, uh, or I mean, uh, Small Batch, and and there's a lot of guys that are taking that what they do in this in in a store setting and try to give that you know more intimate, personalized experience through the internet. You can you can do that that too. So uh, I th I think what, whatever your model is, you should explore all the options that are available to to apply it to. I I, I agree with you on that. Um, also. Um, you mentioned, you know, and it's funny, um, a good example of that is like Neptune cigar, right? I noticed that Neptune, one sure. in, in Miami, I can, I've gone there and I can never park. Right. <laughs> and, and, and so it's almost easier for me to go back to my hotel and have the order just delivered to me. And then when I get back home from Miami, it's there, you know, I, I hate to say it, but so I think parking is a huge, I mean, I could tell you, uh, there was a private cigar lounge in Charlotte that had a parking problem in it and it really led to their demise um it was the old outland cigars when there was a parking lot dispute and it really hurt their business um because people just people couldn't park and then they just went somewhere else is what happened whether yeah, they were yeah, grabbing people, going or staying in the lounge yeah people are busy and, and it was, as soon as that as soon as they start feeling like are they going to get what they came for and, and once they start questioning that it's a really bad sign like whether that's you know, uh, are they going to have my cigar in stock or, oh, can I park or wh whatever it is, um, you know, that, that you can maybe once, maybe twice. But after that, the people just thought they find other, other, other venues. So you, you got to be really cognizant yeah. of, of whatever experience you provide, whether it's more, you know, if it's more kind of 
you know, in and out, or it's an, you know, it's a more you know, lounge style, having a full cigar experience, you have to figure it, you know, the ease of that process for, for the person to partake in. Yeah. Another little question I have is, you know, a lot of times, like we hear the big catalog companies are evil, right? And I understand it from the small brick and mortar. Don't get me wrong. Aaron, do you think that's an accurate statement? <laughs> I don't think it's an accurate statement, really. It's a kind um, of a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a different, yeah, it's a different, um, you know, it's definitely a different model, but, um, you know, the ca large catalog brands can, you know, sell on volume and they can reduce price a bit. So that is a, is a competition with the yeah. local B&Ms. And then um, based on where they're located, you know, they can, you know, skip past taxes and things like that. So that's another, you know, price uh, benefit. Um, and I, you know, I think they just see it as, you know, it's competing against the, their local buyers that they would come into the shop if they, you know, selling the same cigars and things like that. But, um, you know, if you have a B and M, you, you know, you, co competing against a, a online catalog is different. You know, you have a lounge, you can do, you know, more personal touches. You can provide an experience in your store that the catalog brands can't. So if you're, if you're, tr you know, chasing the, price conscious buyer or that's all they that they care about you're not really going to compete against them um, unless you're providing something that they can't and that's what the person's looking for so it's just they're different models and they have they have different consumers and you just have to know what you know what you're what you're trying to do like Karen said and um, I don't think if you're trying to just compete against those guys um, for those sales for people that are only looking at price you're just not going to win that battle yeah. And, and again, also, if, if, if with bundles, it's, it's a volume based business, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's, it's a guy looking for to, you know, a, a two or $3 cigar is not generally speaking, looking to hang out and, you know, in a high end lounge and drink a you know, single malt scotch and, yeah. and, uh, and have somebody wait, I like they're, they're, they're not looking for that. And so, and there's a huge part of the population. I mean, if you think of anything, I mean, like as big as craft beer is, Bud Light outsells all craft beer combined because yeah. that, that's, I mean, and I, that's not because it's, you know, the, but, you know, and I, you know, I guess some people would figure, uh, and Bev is bad, but, but, uh, but it's a completely different consumer. I mean, it, it, it's not like the guy said, I, uh, I'm going to have, instead of having my uh, Pliny the Elder, I'm going to go pick up a, you know, a, a case of Bud Light. It's, it's two different, it's two different customers. So I think, uh, maybe Aaron said it, you know, just focus on, Focus on who you're you're aiming for. You know who are you aiming for, and if that if 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 you do that well, you'll be fine. Yeah, but Terrence, you've also but but the cat these big catalog companies that buy it, it's an important part of your business, I would assume, right? I mean, this is this is something that you have to do. How do you balance that out with your retailers? Like when because obviously you do have to sell to these guys. Yeah, I mean, again, it's not it's it's not. I don't want to make it sound like oh man, yeah, I gotta sell them because they can right. buy. I mean, I mean, we. we uh, if, if people uh, want to do business with us in the right way, uh, we're going to, we're going to work with people and we have great relationships with our, 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 our uh, traditional brick and mortars and we have great relationships with the catalogs and, and, uh, and again, there's bad actors in everything, you know? Uh, so th there, there are some online uh, entities out there that uh, buy third party and then, you know, they, they don't abide by the rules of things. And then there's, some brick and mortars that do some, some shady things too. So it's, it's not really a matter of one, one yeah. category is good and one category is bad. It's that you can be a, a great partner uh, in, you know, to us in either of those categories, as long as you're doing things the right way. Yeah. I also think that in some of these big catalog houses, they do have some really good private label stuff um, that, you know, and usually what I try to do is if I'm going to, um, if I buy from them, or if I stop at the CI store or the, the Casa de Monte Cristo store, I, that's what I'll tend to buy at those stores. Something I can't get there, because they have stores as well as a catalog. Um, those, you know, those, but those are the things I'll tend to buy from them. Something I just can't get from my brick and mortar um, that I want to try. And, and I've, had, I've had some good success with some. So there's some very good stuff that's come out with those lines. I mean, and I can only speak from my experience, but the, the, the private labels we've done for, for various uh, companies while I've been with Agonorsa, nobody's been like, hey, what do, you, what do you got that's real cheap? Because to be honest with you, we, that's a closed subject right there. If you're looking to get a whole bunch of overruns for cheap and slapping bands on them, we, we don't really have that 
that business, to be honest with you. So that, that's out right there. But we've never even had that conversation. They've been really into having a great blend and uh, spend time thinking about the sizes. We'll request more samples. Ah, this just wasn't strong enough. Can you have something a little bit more, uh, you know, spice or whatever? Um, so, you know, again, I think I think the, the, the traditional model of like of of catalog, even that word itself. I mean, there's not too many people that even the catalogs basically are used as advertising now. Most people don't even use them anymore. I think you know it used to be this. There was catalogs and then there was brick and mortar. And uh, it was two different models, and there was, a, you know, it, that shifted very much. Where lots of uh, lots of successful brick and mortars also have online sales, as we just talked about, and uh, you know, a lot of the catalogs also have invested in uh, in stores. Very true. Very true. Aaron, do you do you? I mean, do you seek out catalog private label stuff from time to time? I mean, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, if there's um, like on the more premium side, yeah, if there's a brand that does like a exclusive with the, with them i'll seek those out um but in regards to like bundles and stuff like that um i don't really when i first got into cigars I, you know i would try some of that stuff but it's not the bundle stuff really isn't kind of where i want to spend my time anymore so um you know i don't i don't really seek that stuff out but you know there there'll be like um you know a, a sh online place will get like a, a vitola exclusive from a line that's been out and things like that so those right. sometimes those are inter interesting to try um, but yeah, for the most part, the, the bundle stuff, I kind of stay away from. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking of the old, uh, one example, like you, um, there was one size, I forget what, it, I wish I lost my train of thought. I want to say it was a Herrera Esteli or something like that, that went to JR a size and I thought it was really good. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, that, that's what I tend to, or if it's, if it's, if it's by a certain blender, um, and I kind of see that they're not just throwing it out there to trying to make something of it. Like invest in it as a long-term brand right. then, then i have a lot and then i said you know what it's got some legs i'll look at that i'll certainly review it if that's the case with that um as well you know but i i always i mean look i think we're all we all support our brick and mortar people so we're not trying to take any business away from them either yeah uh, i won't bring a don't get me wrong, i won't bring a cigar into the shop from them and smoke it that's kind yeah. of like shitty but you know yeah that's what i'll do there and I think during this time, like, I'm sure you've had the same issue. Well, the, the, you're trying to struggle to find out where you can buy some of these newer releases that will come out this year. Um, and, you know, if you want to buy four different brands, you know, trying to find a one place that has all of those is, is tough. So you're kind of searching around for, you know, who, who you can buy from that has, you know, multiples of what you're looking for. And, um, you know, I've, I've gone around and I've reached out to people in their shops that don't have online presences. Uh, but they'll still ship. Um, so, you know, I'll reach out and do that. Like I reached out uh, to Lake Country Cigars in Wisconsin uh, to buy some cigars. They had, you know, five different lines that I was looking to buy. So uh, I was able to call them up, place the order. They're able to ship them out. It's a b and M. It's not, you know, it's not like a catalog or anything like that. I'm, I'm supporting a and m It's just not my local one. Uh, but it, it works out. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny when when Terrence uh, told Seth about the Supreme Leaf, right? He called he called up uh, Tinderbox, right? Yeah. And and he and he said to me, he had messaged me, hey, Tinderbox has had him, right? But Seth and I didn't talk, right? So I I called Tinderbox up, and they went, no, we don't have it, we don't have. It. I'm like, no, I know it's there. Go look in the humidor, right? So I have this guy in the humidor. I ended up buying four boxes of other stuff. <laughs> He's like, I had that, said that, said, and I ended up. And then finally they said, oh, uh, yeah, they, that was a mistake. <laughs> We're out of it. <laughs> like, oh, he goes, you still yeah. want the four box? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it happened. I mean, it, it happens sometimes. But that cigar went very fast, Terrence. The, the, yeah. I got to say that. Uh, sometimes I, I was like, so, yeah, I did manage to get a, get a couple of those. So I'm, I'm glad. Hey, other than my uh, wild goose chase I sent you on, have you, have you had trouble like initially like locating stuff like Aaron just mentioned has that been a problem to be to find things not with regular production stuff or it's or uh it, it's more the limited release stuff I have a problem with um because that's an interesting thing and and I was I was on a group with barrel barrel burners uh, uh that group the other day I was in one of their zoom meetings and, and I actually asked them about this and I'm shocked like when I want to find something generally speaking I just Google it in, right? I just, I just say, okay. You know, I'm not talking about cigars, anything, you know, it's like, oh, I'm looking, you know, I, I, I read a review of an interesting book. I just 
Google it and it'll, it'll, it'll show up. And I can't tell you how many times people will be like, Hey, I can't, I mean, the Supreme Leaf was a little different because it sold out so, so fast, yeah. but generally speaking, like a quick Google search or if they just or be like, Oh, like I go to this brick and mortar. It's like, yeah, they have it there. Like, I don't know. It doesn't seem like people like put a ton of effort to finding things right. for the most yeah, part. Yeah. I mean, some people do. So, I mean, you guys are obviously an exception to that because it's, it's part of the, what you guys do, but it's just funny to me that people will be like, yeah, I can't I, like, like, where could I find this? And I don't mind answering. I mean, I, I, I like when people reach out to us, but it's always funny to me that they, they seem so hard pressed to find something. And then I'll just like, I even check myself. I'm like, ah, if, if I Google this, would this come up? And, and there'll be like 15 different places they could potentially get it from. So it's just funny. Yeah, we had, I think we had, I've had that problem with three cigars. Um, the Supreme Leaf was one and I did Google it. Um, the other one was the Christoph TAA, which I waited too long to buy. And I Googled it and couldn't find it anywhere. I actually called Jared and Jared, Jared managed to get some to me because I, I like to collect each of the TAA cigars every year. Um, and then I think Unstolen Valor was a little bit of a different case, Aaron, because I think what happened is a couple of retailers got it early. Yeah. And then we sort of sold out everywhere. We couldn't find it. Yeah. But then you met, but then some of them got it. And I guess it was Lake Country that had it, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. So, so it, it tends to be more of the limited stuff that I'll, I'll see that, uh, and it's certain limited stuff that's high profile that we want to uh, obviously smoke, review, and, and, and enjoy them too. So it, it's not, but it's not like that, that TAA one was the first time I ever had a problem finding a TAA cigar. Um, mm-hmm. And that was just because they did a very small amount of those. Uh, and there's other TA so I was like, you can easily get. So, um, you know, but I think for the most part, it's, I haven't had too much problem getting it. But yeah, I, I agree. It's funny. Google's the place I'll always go. And I get asked that from like readers will, will ask me and what do I do? I just Google it, right? Because I know they didn't Google it. And they're like, yeah, you yeah. get it. Yeah, if it's one of the stores we have a relationship with, I'll, I'll send them to those first. Um, One more question for you guys. Uh, news today, inner tobacco canceled. No, so I don't think any surprises there, right? No, yeah. think so. no, no, I don't think that was uh, shocking to anybody. No, um, it, I, the only, the only thing that was interesting about that one was there were a couple of things interesting. One is apparently they got a lot of push. This is what I, the people I spoke to when this, when that story broke this morning, I started doing some phone calls to a couple of folks. And I guess what happened is um, they got a lot of pushback after they announced they were going to try to have it mm. is they got the, there was an incredible amount of pushback. And then ultimately they, they made their decision pretty quickly on that. They were originally going to, I think, hold off on the decision of June, but they decided not to. Yeah. I'm surprised they did anyway, to be honest with you. I mean, what, what difference does it make if you wait another month or something like that? You know, who knows what, things will be, be like but yeah yeah I guess, I guess like you said you get you get enough uh feedback and you say eh, maybe it's not a good idea or maybe there's deposits to be paid or god knows what else so. yeah yeah uh and then again uh aaron just you know not to pick on the ta these guys had the opposite problem they were telling select members first yeah <laughs> so this was like another problem is like then i had uh you know i actually had people in the industry asking me this today like is this true and i'm like i think it is it's like uh uh cause, you know but uh you know i didn't know for sure but yes yeah, so they they kind of bungled that one up i think too they should have just put it out there and made it they made it more difficult i don't know if they i i have a feeling it leaked out earlier than they wanted it to is what happened yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing because, I mean, sometimes in an organization, yeah. if you're involved, you don't want to read headlines saying, oh, why, why was I not made of this first? But then yeah. you run the risk of, I mean, to be honest with you, sometimes we even have that difficulty with with, uh, with reps. Well, they'll, they'll get upset about kind of reading about something. It's like, oh, how come I didn't know about the, this? You know, so, Or why am I reading this press release now instead of you know finding out about it before? So we try to inform them sooner. But sometimes what happens is like, they, you know, somebody sends it out or they, uh, and then it gets leaked out and then, you know, then you have another problem where it's like, oh, well, how come so-and-so got this before me? And so it's a difficult thing. You want, you want to, ha- you know, have everybody be aware, it, you know, but also be respectful of, of, uh, you know, kind of the people in your organization that, you know, probably have a right to know first. Yeah. I, I guess it turns, um, you know, I'm not just saying cause you're on the show and I'm trying to kiss up to you. Uh, Thank over you. the years, oh, it doesn't mind. It's fine. <laughs> over the years, you've been you've been outstanding. Um, I have no complaints. 
with, with how I've been dealing with you with Casada or Aguinar Salif. So um, that, you're you're in the highest tier in my book. Oh, excellent! Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even when you've had to give, like I know you something you have to do to cigar fishing, and I get that, but we've gotten it timely, and that's I've, I've always appreciated that. So yeah. that part's been important. So I want to really thank you because that's important to us. Ought to have it timely, and I do understand some of these exclusive windows. So, like I said, I have no complaints on that with you. Yeah, and also sometimes, I mean, I think people, you know, they kind of also have a more traditional model still. Where, like, if I sent you a story, I mean, how quick could you have it up if I sent you a story right now? It's it, right. I'm, I'm like someone in the middle of the day job, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's like when there's a couple of companies that will hold it for two weeks. <laughs> like, that's been where the problem is, or even a few days. That's where the problem's been. But you're right, and it's, and it's the same thing. I understand people aren't, like, refreshing a keyboard. But like I said, sometimes I'm in the middle of a meeting at work, and I can't get to it. And I work on this stuff late in the day or at night or at lunchtime. So, uh, but, I mean, even, even in the worst-case scenario, I mean, how fast could you, could you have a story up within, within 24 hours, I imagine? Not, right? yeah, but now it's actually longer because I actually use a proofreader. So, and when I don't use the proofreader is when I have problems because then Aaron catches it right away. Right? <laughs> and I, he will. No, but it's, most it's, of us uh, can get a story out in a couple hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, most of us can get out a couple hours. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's we're, reasonable we're, with that. We're, whereas with, with them, they tend to they, – they'll send questions back. And it, usually with them, it takes four or five days unless you really push them hard right. to, get it, to get out sooner because they just have a process. Yeah. So with, yeah. you know, sometimes it's balancing with them of, okay, we're going to be releasing this um, you know, Thursday at, at 3 you know, to everybody. Uh, so you're going to need to get it up, you know, at some right. point on Thursday because it's going to be out there. You know? So, you know, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And like I said, you're trying to make everybody happy and it's, uh, it's not easy. No, like I said, and, uh, your stuff's been pretty complete too. when I get it, so it doesn't usually require the, the mo like I get a lot of stuff. It's like requires like multiple either phone calls or multiple emails. So it's always really complete what we get from you. So I got to, you know, again, thanks for that as well. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Guys, anything else before we wrap up here? I think so. All right. Uh, Terrence, I want to get, thank you for hanging around for the show. I want to thank you for bringing, again, Eduardo on as well. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, looking forward to great things. Uh, it was a great night. Uh, mm -hmm. so the greatest night of our lives. It was a great night. <laughs> no, this was like, uh, this was one of the boxes I got to check tonight. So I was really, uh, really happy about that. Uh, on that. So, yeah, so, and thanks for sticking around as well. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, to our audience, thank you as always. Um, this has been a great, this has been, a, Aaron, this, I don't know if we've ever had a month like this of guests. So no, I think it's been uh, one of the best. Yeah. They, we, and we, uh, I think we're going to, we're going to shoot for June as well. Yeah. Um, so we have some things in the, uh, like we mentioned, Manuel and Noah is coming on. Uh, we have a couple of others we're trying to confirm. So, uh, and nail down dates for So stay tuned on that. Uh, but that's going to wrap up prime time episode 140 into the annals of history and it is uh still thursday may 28th uh in the u.s and all the time zones we'll see everybody next week have a great night everybody see you guys take care guys <laughs>